Yeah, so I am, uh, my name is Will. I'm a visual journalist at Axios, uh, like Angeline mentioned. Um, and my talk today is going to be basically just like a really behind the scenes look at what it's like to be a visual journalist. Um, you know, with the thought in mind that I think um, I was probably in the same position that some other people in the call are at some point in my life. So, you know, I, I went through the the whole um, journey of like data analysis, learning R, and then getting into visualization, wanting to get into journalism. Um, so this is definitely aimed um, at people that are curious about what we do, want to know more about visualization and possibly um, how you might get into that field. Um, so I'm going to start out by talking about what we actually do. So giving like a really behind the scenes look at what the day to day is like um, for us at Axios. Um, so our work consists of a couple of different types. Um, and this is the case with all of visual journalism, all data viz that you see in the news. Um, the real sort of like bread and butter of what we do is what we call daily charts. Um, so you know, every day in a newsroom, there's reporters that are writing dozens and dozens of stories, and they all need charts for those stories. Um, so we are the ones who make those charts. Um, <laughs> in some newsrooms, um, they have more of that labor shifted onto the actual reporters. Uh, and in some of it, it's more centralized, like at Axios, where we're making the vast majority of charts that you see. Um, so these are usually um, requests that we get through Slack. Um, it probably works differently depending where you work, but um, in our case, our company is remote, so we work um, totally through Slack. So we have a channel where a reporter will put a request for a chart, um, and they'll say, you know, hey, I have some data, um, and I'd like to know how to visualize this. Uh, can you help me? Um, or sometimes they don't have data, and we have to go find it. Um, but these are usually pretty like simple charts. You know, you can see examples on the right hand side here. It's a lot of like line charts, bar charts, little maps, tables, um, and they're very quick turnaround usually. Um, so these are things that like oftentimes are expected to be turned around same day. So somebody might put in a request for a chart and expect it like a couple hours later. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more than that, but most of these are pretty fast. Um, the tools that we use for these. So I put these sort of in order of importance. Um, I would estimate that about 90% of the charts that we make at Axios are made with a tool called Data Wrapper. Um, so if you're not familiar with Data Wrapper, it is a no code um, online tool for making charts. And it has really like revolutionized the way that newsrooms function. Honestly, I think almost every single newsroom, like every top newsroom is using this tool now to make a lot of their charts. Um, and basically what it is, you take your data, paste it into their, um, paste it into their app online. And then, you know, you just click through the process and you choose like, okay, here's my data. I want to make a bar chart. You choose bar chart, or you can choose line chart, choropleth map, whatever. It has tons of options. Um, and then you can go through that and tweak all your options, tweak the formatting, the colors, um, all kinds of things. And uh, the really great thing is that they have styles preloaded. So um, Axios, like any newsroom, we have our own visual styles for charts. Um, and Data Wrapper has basically built us a custom template so that all of our charts come out looking the way that we want them to. Um, and it's a pretty flexible tool once you get to know how to use it. Uh, another tool that we use quite often is Adobe Illustrator. So this is when um, we have charts that are um, a little bit more complicated. So, you know, Data Wrapper is a no code tool. So it only has so many options, right? If they don't have the option to add something, uh, you can't do it. And so at that point, we will take a chart into Illustrator. Um, and it's usually a chart that we've like started in Data Wrapper or in JavaScript or in R or some other program. And then we pull it into Illustrator to really do like the final touch ups to add a little bit of visual flair to maybe fix some issues um, and publish it basically as an SVG um, through Illustrator. We also have a tool called Hermes, which is uh, basically a little tool that we built in house. And you can think of it a lot like a little baby version of Data Wrapper. Um, 
but basically what it is is like a tool you can paste in your data again you can get a chart out of it make a line chart make a bar chart by just clicking a few options um it is much 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 simpler than data wrapper so it has very few options and it's pretty limited in what it can do but it's really great because the entire newsroom can use this so you know a lot of times a reporter just wants to make like a stock chart or a line chart and they don't need our help for that they can do it themselves with hermes um and finally, we do a decent amount of work with uh, code. So since we're publishing all our graphics on the web, it has to be made with JavaScript uh, and HTML and CSS. Um, we use a framework called Svelte to publish our charts online. Um, and a lot of these that we're making for like the daily charts when we're using uh, JavaScript, because it's not it's usually not like super fast to write. So it takes a little bit of investment, but um, what we've done is develop these templates again so that we can basically take our data, paste it into these templates and get a nice little table out. Um, and sometimes they're a little bit fancier. So what I showed you for the daily charts was, you know, pretty standard basic examples of like the majority of what we make, um, but we're always looking for the opportunity to be creative. Um, so, you know, anytime a reporter comes to us with a request, we're always thinking like, what is the, you know, what is the most clear way I can show this, but also is there kind of a fun or engaging way that I can show this? Um, especially if there's a lot more to the data, you know, sometimes they're really simple data sets, but if they're more complex, um, and they have more, um, potential, then we really try to lean into that. Uh, and a lot of these ones are also ones that we pitch ourselves. So, you know, it's not just reporters coming to us, but we will come up with our own ideas for data sets we've found or stories we want to tell. Um, and we'll come up with an idea for a graphic and pitch that ourselves. Um, so the other side of the coin is um, visual stories and news apps. So these are larger, like full page stories, which use combinations of text, charts, photography, illustration, and interactive elements to tell a story. Um, they could be explanatory. So, you know, it's guiding you through a story or it could be exploratory where it basically gives you uh, a way to explore a data set for yourself. Um, and these are definitely long-term projects. You know, these have to be designed and coded from scratch. And so they're gonna take, you know, minimum a few weeks um, and, you know, even up to like a year or longer uh, to code. Um, and the tools that we're using for these are um, similar but different to what we use for daily charts. So it really depends on the project. You're going to use all kinds of different tools. You know, I could make a list of 100 different tools we've used for visual stories um, in various forms. But, um, you know, definitely the biggest ones are Figma which is what we use to design all of these stories. So we make you know, high fidelity wireframes of all of these stories before we publish them because we wanna really design everything upfront before we put the effort into engineering it. Um, and so Figma is the tool of choice for that. If you're not familiar with Figma, it is a vector editor. So it's like Adobe Illustrator. You, know, you can edit SVGs, draw rectangles, do stuff like that, but it's really built with web design in mind. So it has a lot of really nice functionality um, that basically makes it very, very easy to use for designing websites. Um, and it's also really nice for designing charts, FYI. Um, and then the actual project itself, we always build with some combination of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, and usually using the Svelte framework. Uh, we use R a lot for doing data analysis. Um, and I should have mentioned that under the daily charts too, but we use R probably every day. I use R every day. Um, it depends on, you know, your individual preference as like a data journalist. Some people use Python or Excel or SQL or whatever. Um, but R is very, very popular in the journalism world. And so we're using that to do web scraping, to collect the data, to analyze it. Um, usually not as much for making charts. Um, again, if we need to make like a static chart for one of these visualizations, uh, we would probably use Adobe Illustrator and then embed it in the website. Um, and it really depends in terms of like the balance between visual stories and um, the daily charts on your newsroom and your position. So, you know, there's people that are spending 100% of their time on one or on the other. And then there's people that are doing some of both. Um, and it really depends on your newsroom and, um, you know, what your priorities are. 
So to go a little bit deeper even, I wanna do a case study of one of these full page um, visual stories that we made. And this was last year. This is the coronavirus variant tracker. Um, you can go search for it and it'll come up uh, from Axios if you wanna take a look. Um, so talking a little bit about the background and the goals of this project. Um, at the time, <clears throat> this was when variants were really becoming a thing in the news. This was you know, back, if you can remember, in the days when um, we didn't know much about variants and they were a novel thing. Um, so at that time, there was like tons and tons of information flying around about, you know, this variant and that variant, and this one is more infectious and this one is more deadly. And there was, it seemed like there was, you know, a dozen news stories every day that each focused on like a little piece of information, but it was so scattered and distracting that you could never really get like a holistic picture. And the few places where you could get like the entire uh, body of information, it was so overly complex and scientific um, that it wasn't really approachable to a normal person. So our goals were to basically take all of this info on the variants, verify it, um, and then present it in a really easy to understand format. Uh, we also wanted it to be quick. So we wanted it to take like five minutes or less to scan the page and get all the information you needed. And we wanted it to be updating on a frequent basis because we knew this information would be changing a lot. And another key step, so whenever you're talking about a visual story or data visualization in general, one of the most important things is identifying who's your audience. So in this case, we knew that our audience was definitely non-experts. So you know, we weren't making this for scientists or policymakers. Um, we were making this for just the average person that you know is not a scientist and wants to know about these things. Um, it's also for our demographics, which are definitely a little bit more educated and skews a little bit older in the case of Axios. And obviously for people in a hurry, because that's, you know, that's what we target. Um, and that was definitely the goal of this project. Um, so on the data side of things, there were really two components to this project. Um, one of them was just like the facts about the variants themselves. So, you know, how much more transmissible were they? Um, were they susceptible to vaccines or were they resistant to them? Could they reinfect people? So this kind of key information we had to basically just do by doing old school, you know, traditional journalism um, reporting. So you know, going out, reading, um, reading other stories, talking to scientists. We talked to a lot of subject matter experts. We relied a lot on the CDC and the World Health Organization um, because a lot of these things there were you know multiple preprint scientific studies and they don't they don't always agree. So you have to come up with a way to find out what is really the best source of truth, and then also how can you communicate the uncertainty in those sources. Um, and then the second component that we knew we wanted to have was information about where the variants were spreading. So we could get this prevalence data. Um, this data is tracked. So you, know, you can look at where are these, where is each variant more prevalent? Um, and then we actually found a really great API that served that data. And so we wrote in our script um, that would pull data from the API and wrangle it into a format that was useful and then um, spit out a JSON file for us to use. And uh, we put this R script on a GitHub action so that it would just run every single day um, automated and we'd always, have, we'd always have automated data to pull. Um, thinking about the design inspiration. So this is an important phase because um, we, you really have to figure out how to translate your goals and your audience um, through your design. So we knew that, you know, it'd be very easy with things like coronavirus to go in kind of a scary direction with the, um, with the design. You see a lot of things about COVID that are, uh, you know, use very like striking high contrast colors, reds, things that seem alarming. Um, we knew that we didn't want to go that direction because our goals and our audience, we wanted this to be something that was approachable and welcoming so that people actually wanted to use it. Um, so that was right off the bat. And then we also knew that we wanted it to be really clean, uh, simple, and scannable um, for the other reasons that we mentioned earlier. So a few images I found that inspired the design was um, this top image was, was pretty influential. I think this was an illustration that was done in I want to say The Economist, I should know this. Um, I think it was on The Economist or maybe Financial Times. 
Um, but I really like the way that they rendered uh, the virus particle here with this sort of vintage like uh, dot screen print and hand-drawn style. Um, for the colors, I found we knew that we would need a lot of colors because there were a lot of variants and there were going to be even more. Um, and so I got initial inspiration from this uh, bottom left picture, which is, I think, a project for like a Italian paper company. Um, but I ended up tweaking those colors a lot and then adding a ton more colors to them because, you know, the variants just kept coming. Um, and then finally, I'm, you know, microbiologist by training. And so I did a lot of work with proteins um, and protein structure when I was in school and, and uh, earlier in my career. And so um, these sort of cell shaded protein diagrams were a big inspiration to me too. And um, all of that resulted in this. So, you know, there's, this is part of a much larger website, but I've just taken a screenshot of the key bit for you to see here. Um, to talk about how we we pulled this off. So what you can see is that um, we decided to render each of these variants as a card and then put them you know side by side. Um, and there's more down below where there's more cards. And so there's different tiers of variants. So these are what are called variants of concern. Um, and there's others that are at a lower tier uh, that I'll show you in a second. Um, but each of these cards, we have an illustration of the virus, again, inspired by that sort of hand-drawn textured style. And one of our amazing illustrators, Brendan, did the illustrations for this. He did a great job. Um, and then we kind of continue that uh, as you go down with the name of the variant. And there's some sort of little design details that give it uh, almost like a vintage newspaper vibe, I want to say. Um, and then you have these key facts here, which I'll talk about in a second. And then at the bottom, you have a map of the US, which is a choropleth map of the prevalence of the variant. Um, and if you hover over that map on the interactive site, you can see um, more information about the prevalence. So, you know, what percentage of the coronavirus in your state belongs to that variant. Um, but in the case of the key facts here, I want to talk a little bit about how we achieved our design goals um, and how we implemented it. So, you know, we wanted this again to be very scannable, uh, quick to read, and very like smart brevity, which is our style at Axios. And so we achieved that using um, really concise descriptions that are very focused, um, using iconography, and also using color. So, um, you can see what we've done here is each of these key facts has an icon that it belongs to. So, you know, this one is for how much more transmissible is it? Uh, how much more deadly is it? Uh, how does it respond to vaccines? Can it reinfect you? And where was it first discovered? Um, and then in each of those cases, we've also color coded it on the left with basically good or bad. So red is bad, you know, more transmissible. Vaccines are less effective. These are bad things. Um, and blue is good, so causes less severe disease, that's a good thing. And then gray is just a neutral color. Um, and we also kept the descriptions pretty short and concise, like I said, and we were always very careful to include um, hedging. So, you know, a lot of these things were based on initial studies. So we would say something like may cause less severe disease, but more research is needed to confirm that. Um, and this is just for fun, um, what you see below the variants of concern. This is all the other variants. Um, it did not start out this big, but you know they just kept coming. So we had to come up with more and more and more colors. Um, I do think at some point there will be a, a phase theoretically in the future where we exhaust all the known colors um, trying to make these variants. But so far, we haven't gotten there yet. All right, um, so I'm gonna pivot now and talk a little bit about how I went from uh, you know, no background in this area to visual journalism. So this very complicated diagram I've made. Um, <laughs> I am gonna talk about how, um, what you see at the top here, this you know, by daylight, this was, this was basically um, my day jobs at the time. Uh, from after I graduated college until I got to where I am now. Um, and then this is always the stuff that I was doing um, in my free time, so to speak, which was often at night, so by moonlight. Um, and then along the way, you know, I was picking up these different skills uh, at various points. 
So I mentioned I had my background in microbiology. So I started out as actually a lab technician. Um, I was doing some computational work at this time, but I was still doing like pipetting, you know, like doing actual experiments at the bench. Um, and I wasn't super sure at this time what I wanted to learn. So I was just exploring all kinds of different things. You know, I was reading about data viz fundamentals. So I got one of those books, you know, like the standard like textbooks that are like the just the fundamentals of data viz or whatever. Um, and I would read that at night. Um, I was taking like some online courses, like free, you know, those free courses online on like HTML and CSS. Um, and I was trying to get better at R. So I was practicing my R at this point, which was still pretty like pretty basic. Um, and then eventually uh, I got a job at the University of Pennsylvania as a data analyst. Um, and I was also making a lot of visualizations at this point because my boss was really into that stuff. So it was like half data analyst, half data visualization person. Um, and all of that work was happening in R. So I was definitely practicing my R skills at this point. Um, but this was really the year that I think I decided, like, I want to be in journalism and I want to be doing data viz. Um, and so I just went really hard on that. I thought, okay, what are all the skills I need to learn? And how can I basically prove that I can do this um, while practicing my skills? So this job was really great because it allowed me to practice, like, data viz fundamentals and it allowed me to practice R but it didn't really creatively challenge me. So I set out to do all these creatively challenging things in my free time. Um, I started doing this series of blogs on art. So generative art with R um, and you can read those all online, uh, but this was a really great way for me to practice R um, and get a little bit more advanced at that. And then also to um, practice my visual skills. Uh, I also started learning D3 at this time during this like 100 days coding challenge. I just thought it would be fun. Um, I only made it through like half the days, I think, of the official challenge. But, um, you know, at this point in my life, I've definitely done 100 days of D3. Um, I did a little bit of freelancing. So I kind of got this random freelance offer at this point, which was not very, you know, influential, but that started. Um, and then I really leaned hard into these uh, data viz challenges, like creative data viz challenges and competitions um, to try to build a little bit of name for myself and practice and get, you know, like get some projects in my portfolio. Um, so I did some mapping competitions. I think I did like a data visualization society held a competition I did. Um, and then this viz risk challenge I took on and I didn't think at the time it would be like a big deal but I ended up getting really into it. And it just kind of was like, you know, a snowball like rolling down a hill, like it just got away from me. And then, um, you know, it was sort of a confluence of all these factors. Like at that time, I was also really learning JavaScript and D3 and, and sort of getting into design. And so I just took like everything I knew and worked all night for a month and a half. And then I, by the end of it, had this um, whole like scrolly telling visual story that was really my first big visual story. And I think it's still one of my best, honestly. Um, I was really proud of what I was able to produce for this challenge. Um, and I think this project that I made during that time was a big part of the reason that I ended up getting a job as a data visualization designer at Fidelity. Um, so this was a really exciting job move because it was gonna be doing data visualization full time and it was more from a design perspective, which I really wanted to get more into. Um, so during this year, I just went super hard on design because I decided like that is what I want to do. A, it's like it's what I enjoy doing and it's what I think would really put me, um, you know, like set me apart. And so I basically bought every book I could find on typography, color, grid systems, user experience design, and I would read those books, um, read those books every night. Um, and then during this time, I also did a little bit more freelancing. I kind of got more into that world. So I did some more serious freelancing. Um, I did a couple of contests still. And then I, I did a personal project that ended up being my first like published in an official publication story um, in Scientific American. And that was definitely a big reason why I ended up getting the job at Axios because I could say, hey, like I have some experience actually doing real visual stories. Um, and you know, by the time I had worked at Fidelity for maybe like a year, I started feeling like, okay, I'm, it's time. I think I actually have enough skills now to make it in journalism. Um, so I did. 
Uh, and I'm still doing a little bit of moonlighting these days, not as much as I used to, definitely. You burn out a little bit on that. And also my days are just so much busier now. Like uh, working in journalism is, is a very, very fast paced job. And so it doesn't leave me as much time to do stuff on my free time, but you know, still doing a little, little bit on the side. I can never stop, uh, still learning, of course. Um, so I, I gave a talk uh, a little while ago, or I was on a podcast or something, I forget. But anyways, uh, somebody in the crowd asked me, I talked about moonlighting, you know, because freelancing, I, I was always doing a day job. And so doing a day job and freelancing is called moonlighting. And so they asked me, oh, is it called moonlighting because you just work all night and you never sleep? Um, <laughs> so this is definitely not the case. Um, I do sleep. Um, and you know, I get this question a lot when I talk about like how I made this transition because um, it's definitely a lot of work. You know, there's no denying that it is like I, I would be working all day and then coming home and working all night, basically. Um, but what I tell people is that um, A, that's something that comes from, first of all, it comes from a lot of privilege, right? Like I was able to do that because I didn't really have any other responsibilities. I didn't have you know, a family to support or anything. Um, so I could afford to do that. Um, and the other thing is that, no, I was not really like working all day at these day jobs and then coming home and working all night. Um, most of the jobs that I had during this period were things where it was really like a get your work done kind of system. So, you know, you're not on the clock. If you get your work done, great, good for you. Um, we don't expect you to keep working. Um, and so I had jobs where I would be able to, you know, get all of my work done in like 20 or 25 hours a week. And then I had all that extra time to focus on, you know, these learning things I was doing, writing blogs or, um, you know, doing personal projects or reading books and all that stuff. Um, so again, it's something that comes from a place of privilege, but if you're able to do that, um, then you're lucky. And it's a great way to um, build your skill set while you're still working. All right, um, so now that I told you how I did it, um, I basically did it blind, so I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I wish I had had someone to tell me along the way what you should do, um, so I am now that person. Um, so if you are interested, um, here we go. The first question I get a lot is, do I need to go to school for data visualization? Um, no, definitely not. Uh, I think almost everyone I know in data visualization came from some weird background, um, and very few of them have degrees. Um, it's not a bad thing I'm saying. If you, if you do think that like that's how you learn and you're young and you think I could do a program, um, these days I know that there are more master's programs coming out for data visualization, but you know, even a few years ago, which is not that long ago, um, when I was getting into the field, that was very rare. Like I don't even think many of them existed at that time. Um, and this is my boss, by the way, um, Danny. And yeah, she has, no idea where any of her direct reports went to school and doesn't care apparently. So um, you don't need to worry about your degree. Um, so when I think about visual journalism, you know, it's, it's difficult a lot of times for people getting into the field because it feels like there's so much to learn. You know, it's all these different skills kind of amalgamated into this weird um, interdisciplinary thing. Um, I think of it a lot like a combination of storytelling, design and technical skills. Um, and I would also put data skills under technical. It's very important to have data, you know, data analysis or data science adjacent skills. Um, I think for the people on this call, you don't have to worry as much about that. I'm sure you're all excellent at that already. Um, you know, and that was where I was coming from as well. So I was also coming from a place where I was really comfortable working with data, gathering data, wrangling it, doing some analyses, you know, basic statistics, stuff like that. Um, and that is definitely a really, really good base to have to get into the field. Um, but the other thing to understand is that uh, when data viz departments in, uh, in newspapers or in journalism outlets are hiring, they're not always looking for like that one person that does everything. Um, everyone on our team at Axios has different skills that they excel at. Um, and 
you know, we complement each other. And so when we're looking to hire somebody, that's usually what we're looking for. Like we might be thinking, hmm, you know, we are a little bit lacking in like coding skills, or we really need somebody that's good at mapping, like a good cartographer um, or a good data scientist. And so that's what we're looking for. Um, and usually what we're looking for is somebody that has sort of some general knowledge about data viz, has a decent base of um, like fundamentals built up, but we don't expect people to be an expert in every area. So you can go into a newsroom trying to be specifically a developer, an engineer. Uh, you can go in trying to be more of someone who makes like infographics, like you might even be an illustrator, you might draw and use Adobe Illustrator and design tools uh, and make charts that way. Uh, you might be more of a designer, an art director, or even a data journalist where you're doing like predictive modeling. Um, you know, there's teams at uh, like The Economist and 538 and The Times and stuff like that, where they're like hardcore data scientists doing machine learning and predictive analytics um, for the news. Um, and so that's definitely an option if you're interested in that. So I did mention that it's good to have fundamentals. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these areas, the storytelling, the design, the technical, um, and what I think are some important qualities or skills that you would develop if you're interested in getting into the field. So in the case of storytelling, um, this is a sort of a nebulous thing. Um, you know, it could be if you say, oh, you're good at storytelling, it's, it's not immediately obvious what that means to some people. Um, but when I look at uh, a potential hire, when I'm looking for somebody uh, in this area, I'm really looking for curiosity. So I'm looking for a person that can ask interesting questions and develop unique ideas for stories. Um, because that's really what, you know, we're in the business of after all. Um, and that I, I would say is like by far the most important thing. If you can come up with really, really interesting questions and story ideas, um, that alone is, you know, can be enough to get hired um, uh, in this area. Um, the second skill that's really important is research. Um, I think, again, probably everyone on this call is, is pretty good in this area. Um, this is, you know, actually carrying out those ideas. So, you know, we, once you have an idea, you need to find data to support it. You need to um, go through the, the research process, you know, forming a hypothesis, testing your hypothesis, um, analyzing your data, all of that stuff. Um, and finally, I would say, you know, a, a crucial skill, but not one that you necessarily need to have as a beginner is um, narrative skills. So, you know, this is actually crafting a story out of all this, out of your idea and your research, taking all that information and turning it into an engaging narrative that a reader um, would want to sit down with is a really important skill. And if you are able to develop that, or if you have that, um, that's awesome. Um, but this is also a skill that you can learn on the job. You know, when you go into a journalism department, it's expected that you will learn how to do journalism. And um, this is a big part of that. So again, another one that's sort of nebulous to a lot of people, or especially I know when you're coming from a technical background, um, there's a lot of things if you start reading about design that will seem really frustrating. Um, I know I had this experience myself because you uh, read books and you're used to reading technical books, which will say things like, okay, to, you know, perform a paired T test, this is what you do, or, you know, this is how you write the code to do this. And when you read design books, it often reads more like sort of a manifesto. It's just like, you know, oh, to develop good colors, you must just practice and choose nice ones and, you know, things like that. It's very like non-concrete advice. Um, so, um, there are a few resources you can find that have more concrete advice and you know, feel free to reach out to me if you would like those resources, I'm happy to point you to some. Um, but I would say, don't worry too much about getting too caught up in these sort of design teachings and um, like creating really beautiful, stunning, like, you know, show-stopping charts. When I'm looking at like an entry level person in data viz, in terms of design, I'm really looking for something where the design is not distracting. Uh, you know, it's not like they've chosen things that distract that detract from the chart. Um, 
And mostly what I'm looking for is someone that knows how to do nice, uh, clean charts. So, you know, something where um, they have good hierarchy, good editing and colors, which I'll talk about in a second. So these are the three skills that I think are really the most important. Um, hierarchy means uh, basically being able to design the different elements in such a way that they each have uh, an order of importance within your chart that guides the reader through how you want them to see. So, you know, this is an example of like what I might design a tooltip uh, to look like on a Coropleth map. So, you know, let's say this is, we're hovering over this state and it says Texas, and this is the positivity rate for COVID or something. Um, now, one way to design this tooltip would just be to write Texas and then in the same size font to write positivity rate, colon, 43%, all in the same font. This has no hierarchy to it. Right, It's not easy for a reader to just navigate right through. It doesn't really draw them in. Um, and so a much better way to do this is to have you know, different type styles that emphasize the importance. The most important thing here is the number itself. So we make it the biggest and it stands out the most. You know, We adjust the colors of the other text and the, the weight of the text um, so that it's um, still there, but less distracting. <clears throat> and this is a huge thing. If you can master hierarchy, um, this will, you know, take your charts completely to the next level. Um, another really important thing is editing. So editing means uh, basically taking away anything that's unnecessary. Um, immediate things that come to mind are things like grid lines, which are often um, unnecessary or they're too big, too distracting. So, you know, removing grid lines that aren't necessary, making them lighter removing access labels that aren't necessary, removing legends that aren't necessary. Um, a good example here is um, oftentimes we get polls that people wanna make a, a poll uh, chart and the respondents have answered yes or no to a question. And you know the default chart, I see this all the time, even from like professional data viz designers will be to put yes and no next to each other. But the amount of no is just the you know, what's left over of the yeses up to 100% usually. So it's completely extraneous. And you can make a much more easy to interpret chart by rephrasing the title to be something like, instead of being, you know, how respondents think about whatever, um, you can rephrase it to be like percentage of people who agree that X, Y, and Z, and then just plot the agree category. Um, another important part uh, that I would put in editing is white space. Um, so a lot of charts are way too packed close together. Everything is really cramped. Um, giving your chart room to breathe is very important. Uh, and finally, color. Um, color can be very tricky to learn. You know, it's something that, um, again, there's not a lot of uh, really concrete resources on color. Um, I think when I look at colors for data visualization, the two things that I look at most are one, are you using color um, in like a technically appropriate way. So are you using a diverging scale where you should be using it or a sequential scale where you should be using it? And those are things you can find in books, how to use them. Um, the other thing is not using too many colors. So, you know, a lot of charts will just randomly plop color on them for no reason at all. Um, you should always aim to reduce the amount of colors, uh, different colors in your chart, um, you know, beyond a certain point. Um, and the, the final thing is just choosing colors that are harmonious, that go together, that don't clash. So a lot of charts that come out of default programs have these very primary um, and like poorly chosen colors that just clash with each other. Um, again, that's something where, you know, I can't tell you in five minutes how to choose colors that won't clash, um, but I can tell you that colors are free. So, you know, they're not copyrighted or anything. Um, the best uh, advice I can give you, honestly, is go find really beautiful, well-designed charts and just copy their colors. Um, uh, you know, there's lots of lists of excellent charts out there. You can go to the Information is Beautiful Awards uh, archives. You can go to the Society for News Design archives and look at like award-winning charts from all over the world and essentially just emulate what they do. Uh, and this is a really good way to learn design. You know, this is how, this is a big part of how I learned design was basically finding work that I thought was the best and emulating what they did. Uh, finally, the technical skills. 
So data analysis, um, I'm not going to spend any time on this. I think you all are probably excellent data analysts. Um, on the design side of things, uh, the Adobe suite still rules in the visual journalism world. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to learn the Adobe suite before you apply for these jobs. Just know that if you do have access to Adobe products, um, this would be a useful skill to pick up. You know, this will be something that if I saw this on a resume, someone says, I am very comfortable with Photoshop and Illustrator, I would say, great, that's a big plus in your, uh, in your corner. Um, but, you know, when I applied for these jobs, I did not know Illustrator and Photoshop. I had never used them before. Um, partially, primarily because um, I objected to Adobe's licensing model and I think that they um, are too greedy and are not worth $50 a month. Um, and I still think that. But um, what I did do is learn another vector editor. So I mentioned Figma before. Um, Figma is a wonderful free vector editor and the skills that you would learn in Figma are all completely transferable to Illustrator. So, you know, if somebody told me, well, I don't know Illustrator, but I know Figma, I'd say, great, no problem. You can pick up Illustrator in a week, you know, if you know Figma. Um, and finally, uh, web development is a big part of this. You know, almost all graphics now are published on the web uh, in the news world. And so this is not something that is a required knowledge. You know, there's lots of people that work in um, visual journalism who are just designers, data analysts. They don't do a lot of web development. And you definitely don't have to have this before you apply. Um, but you will see in job applications, you know, they may be looking for this in particular. So um, like I mentioned earlier with the different types of jobs, there are jobs that you can apply for that will not require this, but there are definitely jobs that will. Um, and it really just depends on targeting your search in that case or in learning web development if you're interested in that. Um, it's definitely a big undertaking. You know, I don't want to under, underestimate or undersell um, web development. There's a lot to learn. Um, but here's my advice for doing that. A lot of people in the data visualization world have this um, sort of uh, like reverent view of D3 um, as a library, and they think, okay, learning how to code data viz means learning D3. Um, I'm here to tell you that is not the case. So <laughs> if I were recommending someone these days to learn uh, coding data viz, so to speak, I would tell them to learn first HTML and CSS, which you can pick up pretty easily. Second, to learn the basics of vanilla JavaScript. And then third, to learn Svelte, um, which is a, a JavaScript framework. And D3 is definitely important, but it has reduced in importance a lot um, in the last five years or so. Um, and these days, we use it more as like an accompaniment library, where we're not building the entire chart with D3, um, but we're using little bits and pieces of D3 along with these other technologies to help us build the charts. Um, as I said before, you do not need to be an expert in all these things. So, you know, dabbling a little bit here and there and being more experienced in one of these areas is definitely um, a good way to go. Um, focus on the fundamentals. Uh, you can learn a lot on the job. So showing that you're willing to learn is a, is a great way um, to get into the field. Um, and you can do it. It is definitely possible. Uh, before I go, I want to give a really quick uh, plug to one of the most exciting projects that I'm working on right now, um, and something where if you're looking for even more uh, inspiration and advice and like hardcore um, technical advice on how to get into creative data viz, uh, freelancing, journalism, uh, make the job switch, um, this is a great resource. So this is a learning community that I run with four other or three other people, uh, Duncan Gear, um, Ali Torben, and Gabrielle Merit. Um, and this really came about because um, a couple of years ago, uh, Duncan reached out to me and basically wanted to form like a little support group for um, data viz freelancers. Because you know it can be very lonely when you're working on your own. And so we just wanted to talk about um, career advice with each other and things like, how do we deal with clients? Can you give me feedback on this project? Um, and it ended up becoming this incredible group, um, you know, and something that really like changed the trajectory of my career. 
um, just getting to know and work with these amazing people. And through that experience, we had two issues. One was that we had a lot of knowledge we had developed that we wanted to share. Um, and the other was that uh, we wanted to sort of replicate what we had done in a more sustainable way. So we couldn't just keep inviting people to our group because it got too big. Um, so we decided to launch this membership program where we would um, share all of our skills and knowledge. We make videos, live streams, Q and A's, um, tons and tons of blog posts, and we're very reactive to what members are wanting to learn. So we have a really welcoming Slack community. People will come post their work, get feedback, ask questions, um, and really get like one-on-one -on -one mentorship with you know all four of us um, who are all from different fields and all have different expertise um, in data viz. Um, and it's been really, really wonderful. So if you're interested, I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, and with that, I will say thank you very much. Um, thank you to all the people at Elevate who have helped me so much. Thank you to all my amazing colleagues at Axios. And questions? Thank you so much, Will. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, so I think uh, we're gonna, we, got, we just got one question in the chat. So um, for everybody else, if you've got questions, just feel free to paste them in the chat and we can go through them um, one by one. Um, so Jen Richmond says, great talk. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, would you talk a little bit about the job application process you went through to get your job at Axios? Tips on building a portfolio would also be great. Thanks. Yes, okay. Um, so tips on building a portfolio I'm going to do first because that's really the key to applying for a job. Um, my tips for building a portfolio are to focus on depth rather than breadth. So rather than having, you know, a dozen little kind of smaller projects or like not necessarily smaller, I don't want to make the impression that you need to have really big crazy things, but rather than having a lot of little like sort of practice projects or what look like student projects, um, I would focus on making a few projects that are really, really good that you really like, you know, poured your heart and soul into you think there is a really unique idea. It really speaks to you. It has really interesting design, um, something that you feel really strongly about and really highlight those projects. Um, because the other thing to realize is hiring manager is not going to look at more than one or two of your projects, right? They're very busy. And so um, it's, it's much more effective to put your effort into fewer things. Um, besides that, um, I would say uh, the, also the format, I will mention one thing really quick. The format of your portfolio um, can be anything. So a lot of people get very intimidated by like, oh, I have to build this big website and like put all this crazy stuff on the web and I don't know how to do that. Um, you, I do like, I think it's, it is nice to have a website, um, but you don't have to like build it yourself. Like you can just make a Squarespace website, make a WordPress website, put some images on there with some text um, telling about how you made the project. And that is perfectly sufficient. Um, another way to do this is just to make a document in Figma, in Illustrator, um, you know, in PowerPoint, if you want and put your projects in there um, and that can be your portfolio. Um, when you are making that portfolio and those few projects, make sure to make it more than just images. So um, you want to have images, the example, obviously, of your work. You need to put that in there. Um, but it's really important to have like a case study. So to have text um, explaining what was your motivation for the project? Um, why did you choose this project? Uh, what did you learn along the way? That's really important. Uh, what were challenges that you came up against? And then how did you solve those? So people, you know, a hiring manager wants to look at this and see, okay, I can follow their thought process. Oh, wow, they really thought about this challenge. Here's how they come up with a solution. Um, and that's really what's going to get you hired. Um, and honestly, that's, that's my tip for the application process. You know, my application process was they opened a job opening. I applied for it. I had a resume and a portfolio. And that was it. Um, and every hiring manager I've talked to has said basically like, you know, what's on your resume is fine, but it's not going to be a make or break. Cover letter is not going to be a make or break. It's really all down to your portfolio. Um, so showing that you can do the work is enough. Awesome. 
Awesome. Um, and the says, I echo the portfolio questions, especially if you don't have a public facing data viz from a previous job. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for that situation? Yeah, this is a tricky situation that I hear about a lot. Um, like you're working at a company and your work is private and you're not allowed to share it. Um, so there's a couple of options. Um, option one is well, maybe you can't share it publicly, but you could you know, inquire if you're allowed to share it privately. So you can have a portfolio, like I mentioned, that you just made as like a PDF document. Um, and you, if, if your employer is okay with it, you, know, you obviously need to clear this with them first, but you could just say, look, I'm not posting this publicly, but can I just send this work to a hiring manager, to, to uh, like a private person? Um, if you have no recourse to do that, um, you still, you need to have something to show people, you know, it's like an unfortunate situation, but um, I have asked several other hiring managers about this and they've basically said like shrug, I'm really sorry if you can't show me your work, but I can't hire you without seeing what you can do. Um, so the way to get around that is to do personal projects. Um, you know, again, it's not really fair because you have to do more work in your free time, but that's how it works. So um, you know, doing personal projects uh, or freelance work is is the way to do that. Okay, Ayana wants to know: Do you have any example website portfolios? Um, let me think about that. I mean, you can go look at my portfolio, which I wouldn't say is like the best in the world, but um, <laughs> my website is here: WilliamRChase.com. Um, again, it's like this portfolio has not been updated in like two years, I think, but you can go look at it. There's, you know, it's, it's a few things there. Um, I will have to think about that and maybe send you some examples. Um, if you look up, uh, Nadi Bremer has a nice, uh, portfolio. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned, um, my friend here, um, Gabby. So Gabrielle Marie, if you Google Gabrielle Marie, her like data viz or information design, um, she has a really excellent, like beautiful portfolio with case studies. So, you know, if you're looking for like the, the prime best example, I would go look at um, Gabby's portfolio. And how would you spell um, Nadi Bremer? The name oh, that you is, um, let me, uh, there you go. Um, oh wait, that is a direct message. <laughs> Sorry to whoever I just direct messaged. Um, Visualcinnamon.com, I believe, is her website. Um, and it's Nadi Bremer. I believe that's how you, no, not that. Nadia. Yes, there you go. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, okay. And we have another question. Um, for people that don't have the experience with data yet, what would you recommend? Um, my mentee has an arts background and is learning HTML and CSS, but doesn't have the data knowledge and experience yet. Oh, great question. Um, well, first, I would recommend that they join our ladies, of course. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, so I, I think, again, it's one of those things where there's like different levels of how into the data world you want to be. And they don't, you don't have to be the level of like a data scientist. You don't have to know a programming language even. Um, you know, there's several people on our team at Axios who don't know R, don't know Python, don't know SQL, and they just do all their data wrangling in Google Sheets, and that's fine. Um, so I would say that the, you know, the most important things are understanding, like, how to evaluate data uh, and, like, where it's sourced from. So more important than knowing how to, like, do really fancy data analysis is knowing how to look at a source and think, is this reliable data? Is this trustworthy? And then what can I learn from this data and what can I not learn from it? Because you're gonna get a lot of times where you find a data set or a reporter gives you a data set and they are like, oh, make this chart. It shows that, you know, like, I don't know, this thing goes up and then you, you look at the data and you're like, it doesn't really show that. Or like, it's not convincing. Or that's like, it, you can't really say that based on this data. Um, and so, um, you know, being able to really evaluate data in that way and just do like basic processing, you know, knowing like, I mean, really basic stuff. We're talking like minimum, maximum, like calculating averages, calculating per capita values. Like, I mean, that's the stuff that I do every day. 
Um, I'm not doing like predictive modeling and even like statistics on a daily basis, so. All right, so we're getting lots of questions. This is great. Um, so uh, one of the questions that came up is how did you enter the world of freelancing? Uh, did you use Upwork? No, I did not use Upwork. Um, I would not recommend Upwork um, for data visualization freelancing. Um, I think Upwork, I mean, Upwork is great. I don't wanna disparage it too much. Like I think it has, it, there's really a time and a place for it. But if you're really serious about getting into like data viz freelancing, I think it can become sort of a, a race to the bottom because of the way that people compete on prices. Um, and so it's hard to be like, well, why should you take my expertise, which you know I'm gonna probably charge you a lot more. And there's people out there that are like, oh, I'll design your infographic for like five dollars. Um, and so you know, um, how did I get into it? Um, by the time I got into it, I had developed like a few examples, again, nothing really crazy or impressive in my mind, but like a few examples that I think show that I had decent data viz instincts and that I had a couple of like technical skills that I could apply. And then there was actually somebody in the data visualization society uh, Slack group um, who just posted saying, I need a freelancer to do this thing. Um, if you're interested, message me. And I did, and I showed him my work and he liked it and he hired me. And so, you know, it was a little bit random uh, at the time. I think I was probably a little bit inexperienced, but that was the first one. And then it really builds from there. So, you know, building a freelance business is not easy. And actually what we do in this Elevate group, a lot of this is like coaching people on data viz freelance because I moonlight in this area, but Gabby and Ali and Duncan are full-time data viz freelancers, very successful. Um, and so a lot of what we talk about is how to find clients, how to build your business. Um, and, you know, in the end, a lot of it comes down to networking. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think, um, especially with the Our Ladies community, there's always opportunities that are being posted, um, people who are looking for things. Um, so that's a shout out to everybody. If you want to join the Our Ladies Slack, um, we have a, we have an active Slack community where you can learn about all these opportunities um, and positions that people are hiring for. Totally. Um, okay. Uh, there's another question. So, hi, I'm a data analysis and visualization master student, and D3 is a big thing in the program as well. But I'm actually more interested in R Shiny for interactive visualization, and I enjoy test coding with it. But how popular or unpopular could R Shiny be in the real data viz field? Or would you even deploy an R Shiny project in the area or industry? I mm -hmm. haven't seen much of it, or not relatively at least. Yes, yes, okay. Um, so in the journalism world, um, Shiny is non-existent and D3 and JavaScript and you know traditional web development tools are you know, what 100% of like journalistic um, projects are built on. Um, however, I do know, I, I don't have a ton of experience with this, but I do know that Shiny is used occasionally at least in like businesses. Um, so, you know, I, I did work at Fidelity for a little while and there's definitely like a place in the world of business for these more kind of like internal dashboards and things. Um, where I think Shiny uh, excels. And so it's probably a matter of looking, if you're really interested in invest, like in developing that, you know, it's not something that's worthless. I think it's, it's definitely worthwhile, but you will need to find the company that is like the right niche where they're already invested in the R ecosystem. Because setting up like a Shiny server and really like getting people to buy into that, um, buy into that system takes some infrastructure setup. Um, and so you'll have to find the company that's willing to do that or that already has that set up. All right. Um, we have a question, another question. Um, you said in data viz, everyone has different areas of expertise. Um, what would you say are your areas of expertise and are they different from the skills of the people that you work with? Uh, yeah, good question. Okay, so um, I would consider myself, I, let's see, how will I answer this? Um, 
I, at different points in my career, I definitely excelled in different areas. And so, you know, when I was first starting out, I did not have a lot of experience in like the design aspect, for example. Um, and so I felt like I was um, really more experienced in like the data analysis and storytelling side. Um, and I, I think if I had to like choose one, I would say like storytelling is always king. Like I've always been, that has been like my number one thing. I'm about like research, interesting questions, interesting stories, how to craft a really engaging narrative. You know, that's what I think I excel at the most. Um, and then design would be below that. Um, so I've gotten very interested in design in the past few years. And I think that's something that I'm really invested in and excelling at right now. Um, and then, you know, I do like I code, I mean, I, I do know D3 and Svelte and JavaScript and R and all these things, but I do not consider myself an engineer. Um, like I am not a good coder. I, I don't, um, I like enjoy coding occasionally, but it's not something where I get like really excited and in the weeds about like, oh my gosh, like I can optimize this thing if I come up with this new algorithm, like I have no interest in that. Um, so, <laughs> you know. Um, that's definitely not my my skill set. Um, and they're definitely different different from the people I work with. Yeah. So like there's people on our team that are those, you know, they are that hardcore engineer person. They love like figuring out how to automate everything and how to like build the most, you know, um, like future proof apps and everything. And I love those people. Um, we have people that are like much better at mapping. We have people that are um, really detail oriented and good at like editing because that's a really big deal in journalism as well. You know, we have to edit each other's charts and we have to edit other reporters' charts. Um, so yeah, there's people with all kinds of skill sets. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna tack on one last question because I think that might be it for the for what's been posted in the chat. Um, but you've mentioned several times like uh, that it's really important to ask interesting questions like it's the framework of your storytelling um, and a lot of the work that you do. So how yeah. do you learn how to ask interesting questions? Yes, um, this is an excellent question. Very relevant because um, uh, again, with this group, so this Elevate group, um, you know, we do, we're doing all these like uh, things like that. So one of the questions we get a lot is how do you come up with interesting ideas? How do you develop a story? Um, and so I've, for the past few weeks, been writing these blog posts and guiding our members through this data storytelling challenge, where it's like each week you have a nice, uh, each week you have like a different step. And so week one was like develop an idea. And I wrote like a whole blog on how to like come up with an interesting idea. Um, so that blog was, I think, like 2,000 words. Um, so I don't think we have like 20 minutes for me to sit here and read it out for you. Um, but let me think if I can like come up with a couple of tips at least to help you. Um, I think uh, a few things that are, that are, so a good way to identify a good question. Um, there's different types of stories that you can tell, first of all. So not every story has to start with a question. A lot of stories that you see in journalism, especially if you look at places, like if you look at any journalism outlet, the Times, the Post, Reuters, a lot of their stories are like how it happened or like how it works kind of stories. You know, it'll be like the Tonga volcano eruption, how it happened. And it's really just like a chronological timeline, like walking you through the events that happened. And those stories can be super interesting. Um, another type of story is like how it works. So they pick a topic and it's like, um, you know, like right now we're going through um, obviously this war in Ukraine. You'll see a lot of stories out there that are like um, talking about, you know, um, military tactics or like different weapons and explaining how they work. Um, and that's a very, like, that's a great type of story to tell too. And those are things that are really like much easier, I think, to come up with. But for the questions, okay, so I do love question stories. Um, so question stories, I think, often come out of like very mundane things or things that we often take for granted. And so, um, you know, things that like you would discuss with your friends over dinner um, are great topics for question stories. Um, things that are like common sayings or common beliefs or common dogmas that we don't often question. But if you go look at them, um, you will be like, is that really true? Um, and that can be the great start of a question. 
Um, another way to turn that around is taking something that everyone assumes to be true and then showing that it's true. Um, a really good example of this is um, a famous story by The Pudding, who, which we all love, um, their story on women's pockets. Um, and so, you know, everybody like, years and like everybody who's anybody has had the conversation like ah oh, women's pockets suck right like why are they so small you can't fit your phone in your pocket this is why we have to carry a purse everywhere um and so the pudding was like well let's test it like let's do it let's go out and get the data so they like went around to all these stores and like measured jeans pockets and like did a whole data driven analysis that like scientifically proved that women's pockets suck um, and like, that's an awesome way. It's like taking some, you know, these things that we all like kind of talk about and assume to be true uh, and testing them. Um, and yeah, those are great ways to develop questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Will. This was a great presentation and um, I, I learned a lot about DataViz and I bet a lot of our participants did too. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was really fun. I'm glad I got to uh, glad I got to see you again. Glad I got to talk to you all. Um, my contact info was there, so you know you can Google me, reach out to me if you ever have questions about like data viz, freelancing, um, journalism, any of that stuff. Like I'm always happy to answer questions. So. All right. Good night, everybody.